I, I want to thank you all for coming today with the snow, and I know that there are a lot of reviews, so it's really great that you're here, and I hope that you're all enjoying the hot drink and the pizza to keep warm, and uh, it's great that you're here. I'm very happy that um, we have two really incredible people who will make presentations for us. Uh, first, it will be Mr. Zhang, uh, Zhang Tian, and then uh, Mr. Meng, uh, who um, has just joined us and will be speaking second. Um, I think that this is a really incredible uh, team. It's a, it's a great uh, collaboration because both Mr. Zhang and uh, Mr. Meng have been working together most recently on the, um, on the Shenzhen Biennial, the Biennale in Shenzhen, which uh, uh, Mr. Meng was the chief curator. And uh, that uh, Mr. Zhang's uh, organization company, Xiumyap, was also a supporter, but they have also been working together on architectural projects. Um, I think one of the things that is really, really unusual about Mr. Zhang is that at the moment it's very hard to find people who are in the field of development who themselves are thinking in innovative ways about the future of urban development. Beyond the financial side, somebody who's really looking seeking innovations in urban design and urban development. And you will see from his presentation how he has uh, innovated collaboration with a number of, of architects, including uh, Mr. Monk's company, Urbanus, to really set up a very unusual project in Shenzhen, among many other projects that he has been working on. And he's really a thought leader and someone who thinks about the future of cities. I think Mr. Meng and his colleagues at Urbanus have also been really at the forefront of innovative ideas in both architecture and urbanization, thinking about the role of design, architecture, and, and really the future of, of, uh, of cities uh, for a number of years. And he's someone who has also had a lot of involvement in Europe as well as in the United States, teaching at various universities. Most recently, he's been involved uh, at Syracuse University, but he actually studied here in the States uh, at uh, Miami uh, University in Ohio himself, so he's no stranger uh, to, the, to, the, to the situation here uh, in the US being really such an innovative um, design creator. Uh, as I said, they have worked together on the biennial, but also on these uh, projects. And I think the presentation today called Urban Coexistence, City Upon the City, is something that, that in some ways fits or befits both of their uh, work because of the way in which uh, Mr. Zhang has really worked with urban development, but also the way that Mr. Meng has really focused the, the Biennale in this uh, older part of Shenzhen, in the kind of village, in a way, and seeing the relationship between uh, the, the organization of traditional developments and the founding or the, the development of the new city. So we're really looking forward to hearing them. I'm also very happy that uh, China GSD uh, over the last uh, two days has been so active with these events and with these presentations, and there are so many of you. And uh, Wei Jia Wu is going to be doing the, the interpreting uh, for Mr. Zhang to begin with and also conducting Q&A, and I know a few people are also uh, have kindly agreed to go and have lunch with Mr. Zhang and Mr. Meng afterwards. So please ma welcome Mr. Zhang. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for the Mosen Yuan Zhang for giving us such an opportunity to share with you today First of all, thank you all for coming, and thank you for uh, thank th thanks to you, special thanks to you, Ms. Uh, Mo uh, Mohsen. Tell, tell him, uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, recent work and what we've done in the past eight years, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Gangtai 
Uh, I myself have been working with Mr. Mun for over 20 years, and today is also a very special event for us to share some of our ideas and collaboration. 看到今天，因为大大多数这个情况，所以这一页我会很快。深圳其实，呃，只用一个词就够了，就是快速发展。Uh, I'll, I'll just pass through this page very quickly. So Shenzhen is a very fast development uh, city in the southern China. And it only used to be a little uh, fish town in the 1970s, but over the uh, 30, 40 years it's been growing so fast that it's becoming one of the biggest cities together with Beijing and Shanghai in China. So it's very fast. So in the past, we can see that the center of the city is here. We have a big goal here. 过去它是郊区，所以过去它是一个工业区，它是生产电视机剥壳的一个工厂。呃、uh, ，the project site was located by the previous、uh, Hitachi Industrial Park, and now uh the the uh after demolition, uh it's now becoming the site for this uphills project. 看到下面这张图，深圳其实发展的非常快，这个区域就变成了当时我们叫 CBD 市中心。你们就可以看可以看得到。我们这个的位置就紧紧的挨着这个 CBD 的市中心这个项目的位置。As you can see, there's uh the the Futian CBD only appeared uh like pretty fast. It wasn't even there in 1989, but now it's like you can see it's a big CBD uh in 2009 already. And our site is right next to the CBD. As you can see the、uh, skyline of the CBD in the picture on the right as well. 这张图就可以更清楚的看到我们这个项目和 CBD 的关系。其实最有意思的是，呃，其实我想说的就是说，其实是一个难得的机会，在 CBD 边上有这么大一块土地，有这么高的密度，有这么多的功能在这里边，这个是一个非常难得的机会。其他的城市，呃，不太可能在中心有这么大块的土地需要做这样的事情。Um, the biggest advantage of this project is right, it's right next to the CBD, which might not really happen in other major cities in China. And it's also、uh, it's given a large piece of land together with、uh, a lot of density that's going to be created. Can you see that the project is very good? The environment around the contest is also very good. There are three major mountains and parks. So I think that the contest is also very good. There are three major mountains and parks. 所以我想请各位也就只关注这几个指标就行了。它的用地面积就是十二万一千平方米，容容积率是六点五，总的建筑面积是一百二十万平方米，停车位有五千四百个，最高的一个楼是三百九十米。先把这几个数放在脑子里，想想它是怎么回事。Just thinking about these few numbers. First one is the the total site area is 120 square meters, and the FAR is 6.5. The total architect, the floor,、uh, gross floor area is 1.2 million square me、uh, uh, square meters, and the parking space is、uh, 5400. And also the tallest building is、uh, 390 meters. 五千四没有写错啊，是五千四。It's like five, yeah, fifty-four hundred、uh, parking spaces. 看一下这张图吧，这这这个是我们当时拍的整个周边的一个环境。This is a picture taken before the project happened, and this is a view all the way from east to the southwest. You can see the high density and the emerging growing buildings. 这个就可以很形象的和我们周围周围的一个做一个举例子，我们这个项目相当于二点六个世贸中心的一号楼，四点四个这个叫四三二 Park Avenue 和零点七个梅西百货放在这里边，还有一些其他的东西。As you can see, this is a very huge urban complex, which is equal to 2.6 uh, One World Trade Center plus 4.4439432 Park Avenue and 0.7 uh, Mesa, New York Mesas. So today, because I am a developer, so my all of my questions are from the perspective of the developer, not from the architect. Different from architects or、uh, urban planners, so my view is quite different because I'm looking from a developer's view. 我会把我们开发商的思考给大家讲一下 I'll tell you what we as developers are thinking in this kind of project. 所以在这些功能里面，我们最在意什么？我们最在意的第一个是公寓。你公寓在我们的心目中排位是第一的
，没有谁比它更重要。为什么？因为这块地我们花了六十个亿把它买回来，我们一定要把钱赚回来才行。What we care most about this kind of urban complex is, of, of course, apartment, because we spend a lot of money uh, just buying this piece of land. And definitely apartment is the most, uh, it's going to achieve the most capital recovery and ensure the subsequent development as well. We are concerned about the business. 其他的物业，你很难去，你通过自己的努力去增加它的价值。所以，商业我们是排在仅次于公寓后面的第二位的。And the second one we care about is retail, because retail is the thing that we can keep and also it can generate and、uh, with continuous revenue and it, it grows in value. 其实办公我们放在第三位，因为办公你没办法说我做的比别的办公好。市场上办公好的时候。我们也跟着好，市场上不好的时候，你做的标准再高，他也不会跟着，就说他在那里，别人，都下去，他不下去，他是跟着完全跟着市场走的。所以这个应该说，我们看他是给我们提供了稳定的人流，大量的稳定的人流。Um, office tower is the third one. Why third? Because、uh, it's something that grows with the market instead of like growing by itself. So, but but the good thing is office tower actually provides stable rental income and some stable customers as well. 那么我们还做了一部分，这个我们叫 loft， 我们是希望在办公里面有一些多元化的人流，去让整个这个区域更活跃一点，而不只能只是一种人，啊，它只是给我们带来这个作用。Loft is something that we can have the diversity in、um, a different different kinds of people。其实可能呃，我们做设计的人，很多人都喜欢酒店。作为开发商的时候，我们其实最好不做酒店。Uh, as architects and designers, we actually uh, always uh, have hotels a, as a kind of program in our design. But usually, as developers, we don't like to have put hotels in our project. So, in here, we say, if it has some effect, it is to increase our image image. The only reason we have hotel here is to establish the project image. Is it not similar to what you learn and feel in design? It's probably quite different as what you think in, in design. 所以我们怎么做的呢？可以看得到，第一个，我们在这块地做总图的时候，首先就是要保证我们公寓的视野不要被自己的楼挡住。As apartment is the number one aim of this development, it、uh, the most important view for apartment is to have the whole view, uh, maximize view for all the apartment, uh, uh, rooms and units. 所以你看到我们在做这个总图的布局的时候。我们把最难、最大的、最宽的南向的面全部给了这个公寓，我们没有给其他人留这种视野的这种宽度。呃、uh, ，the biggest site on the south is all left for uh the apartment buildings。你看，包括这栋楼为什么微微向西转一点，就是这栋楼微微向西转了一点，也是为了让它躲开这两栋高的写字楼对它的压迫感。The orientation of that building is to、uh, try to avoid the、um, the shadow and all the uh, the uh, bad effect coming from the、uh, tall buildings. 包括你看，这是我们实景的照片啊。我们卧室里把这个脚的柱脚上的柱子拿掉，让它有一个连续的视野，也是为了在这个卧室里边有非常好的一个景观。所以其实卖这种高端的公寓，其实你的视野是非常重要的，就是卖这个东西。Uh, this is actually a picture instead of rendering. So for this kind of、uh, luxury apartment, the most important thing is the view. We took over the column, having the column,、uh, column free corner that actually provides the best view in、uh, all directions. Second is commerce. So you can see that if it is done in a high-end apartment, it 给了商业最大的一个呃土地上的资源，让它可以尽可能的不受周围任何的一个呃楼的这种干扰，保持商业的整体布局的最大的弹性，就是它可以按照自己的方式去做，而不用去迁就其他人。这就是我刚才排他第二位，我现在就要给他最大的土地资源去支持。
usually retail buildings is only part of the uh, a, a complex uh, project. Usually it's a podium uh, that's below the towers. But here we, we see it more like a village to have the most uh, flexibility and development and potential in the future. I'm going to focus on the commercial part right now. We have commercial we did case study of the three different types of retail space. Usually it's the galleria that's coming with the roof on top, the mall, and also the town. That's more like European little towns. So you should imagine that the previous land use of the area is probably not for commercial use, but we want to co uh, combine uh, commercial, uh, 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 the re retail commercial and uh, apartment together. So you can see that we have a very good mall, FMB, as you can see, we actually put the three different types of commercial here. First of all, we have the mall that's uh, above parking on grade level, and we have luxury retail that's more like a galleria with a rooftop. And also the towns are uh, located on level three, which is the, t uh, the highest. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> So,你看看我们做的多复杂吧。其实这这张图看着那么复杂，其实很简单。商业是需要每一层都有人到的。我们负一层有地铁，一层有南侧的交通，二层有北侧的立体的交通，三层有连接公园的人行的交通，每一层
The soft opening was in January 18th this year, and uh, you can already see there are a lot of people coming, and there are also some changes in facade and uh, the, the building types and space as well. 包括我们原来有一块呃叫 loft 呃 D 这一块，那么最后呢，政府确定把这一块做这个消费电子展示的交易中心。那么这一块所有的装修做完了之后，这里的气氛也发生了整体的一个变化。The loft was then turned into the CEEC, more like an exhibition center, and it also changes the space and the atmosphere of the area. 包括我们无印良品全球首家的酒店和它的。商店还有其他的结合在一起，也是发生了很大的变化。整个那个角，都再加上我们那里有一个索尼的旗舰店，整个那个角都感觉不太像呃其他的地方，像另外一个地方啊。呃、uh, ，the the first the world's first Muji Hotel and also a Sony flagship are also located here。所以这样的一些变化，使我们这个综合体好像不断的在生长。呃、uh, ，you can feel the change and、uh, growing from this complex。这是即将在明年完成的文化东方酒店在我们的项目。This is going to open and complete next year, the Man Mandarin Oriental. 所以，呃，一直到去年年底吧，我们这个项目的公寓和移动写字楼共实现了两百亿人民币的销售。购物中心也在一月份开业。呃，这是一个到目前为止我们觉得非常成功的项目。它把一个过去深圳人都不知道的一个工业区，虽然在市中心。变成了深圳现在一个非常有活力的一个地区。As in the、uh, end of last year, the office towers apartment already achieved、uh, 3.1 billion U.S. dollars in sales, and the shopping,、uh, the major shopping center is also having a soft opening this year. Earlier this year, you can see the、uh, this complex is actually changing.、Um, previously, no one knows,、uh, no one known、um, indus industrial land into a very complex and very、uh, vibrant、um, urban complex. 有几张照片 ？Some pictures of the the site. 这是去年年底的时候的一个情况。This is what looked like last year, the end of last year. The tower is still building, but the. 还有几页，很快。I'm almost done. 呃，这是最后面的一些思考。其实这些才是今天呃要最重最重要要跟大家分享的。其实，在做一个项目的时候，呃，下面这几个我就不说了。其实。呃，往往开发商、建筑师和政府之间的要求，特别是在中国，政府之间的要求，呃，很多的情况是冲突的。Usually, the relationship between architect, uh, developer, and government, uh, is not that good. But uh, the main theme today I'm going to talk about is how they actually collaborate, game, and then balance with each other. 那么我们这个项目其实恰恰呃，到了目前为止恰恰相反。呃，我们这个项目目前开发商我们很满意。建筑师孟岩除了老抱怨我们少花了钱之外，大部分也很满意。政府对我们这个项目也很满意。呃，其实我们进去所有的商家对我们这个项目应该基本都充满了期待。This is actually a very successful project in the aspect that uh me as a developer is very uh satisfied with the result. Uh, Meng Yan as a major architect is very satisfied. Besides that, he thinks we didn't spend enough money in the project, and the government also likes the project really much. And also the retail that are coming uh coming into the project setting up, they they're really satisfied with the result as well, and they, they see the potential. So, uh, 没问题，五分钟一定可以。呃，在我在准备这个报告之前，我们就有一次讨论。其实最有意思的是什么？是什么达成了这样一个成功呢？我们觉得，首先建筑学是这个，是一个变成了首先变成一个开发商、建筑师和政府之间沟通的一个共同的语言的一个平台。就是我们这个项目为什么能达成一致，就是因为在这个之间有一个我们共同建立了一种建筑学的语境，去变成了一个沟通的一个环境。首先是在这个基础上才往前走的。Um, the success of this project is coming from as architecture is redefined as a language that's shared between developer, architect, uh, among developer, architect, and government.、Uh, due to this language, they can all have something in common to share with. That's why it leads to the success of this project. But the result of the project is also becoming a very successful building. And it also comes out as a perfect, a good architecture in, uh, and great uh, building in the end as well. 
所以可以看到你们在做所学的这个专业有多重要，变成了一种沟通的语言和工具了。You can see how important architecture has become. It's becoming language, not just building design. So, actually, uh, we this sentence we thought for a long time to write it. This is very interesting. I should say, at the present, architecture, in light of the complex environmental conditions, we have developed a kind of inner architecture. We have used some of the tools we have used to connect and solve problems. We have solved all kinds of problems through the architecture method. 整合了各种矛盾与需求，形成了这么样一个有机增长的一个综合体。这背后的所有的牵引呢，应该都是用建筑学的手段在做的。Oh, I spend a lot of time just writing this uh paragraph, so has take some time to read about it. It's more about how architecture is um like uh as a logic behind that's acting as a connection, integration, and also um put together all the contra contradictions and demands as a a growing urban complex. 那我们这个项目里最精彩的这一部分，其实一会儿就是梦岩所所要介绍的，其实就是我们的商业和 loft 的融合的那一部分。那那一部分呢，其实是我们目前只融合了商业和 loft 的两种场景，但是它已经变得让我们对我们的下一个项目、对未来，其实充满了期待。The integration of retail and loft has become the major language and uh, idea used here, and Mr. Meng is going to talk more about that as well. That's also going to be a language and a method we're going to use in future projects as well. So we think that actually architecture is evolving. Actually, we in Shenzhen that kind of architecture and and here you see architecture is two kinds of architecture. I came here and I felt this point. I think that in our current thinking, in the past, the spatial and clear space, we in Shenzhen in the future will be more complex and complex. I think, at least in my own imagination, in the future, it's very difficult to define a building. Actually, the biggest possibility is how to use it in the building is the ultimate definition. Um, architecture is evolving. Uh, the, architecture, the architecture I see in Shenzhen, what I see here is quite different. But I think the future of architecture should be more about the integration and complex. There should be more hybrid space that's flexible enough. Um, as space is not just defined as uh, what function it is. It should be how people use it. I think the future of the future of the future will be able to expand many of the limitations of the building. We hope in 更高维度上的一种连接和融合，更多元素创造更自由、包容、融合的一些空间，以适应未来人与城市的复杂性和不确定性。呃、uh, uh, ，due to the development of technology、uh, and everything, I think the in the future the architecture can also、um, jump out of its physical space and out of all the restrictions and have more、um, real connection and integration in the interior and exterior as well. 呃，我也看了很多过去经典的建筑，但是其实做那些经典，我们总是羡慕为什么我们没有机会去做那些经典的建筑。其实是因为做那些经典建筑的环境已经不存在了。我们现在在也在和哈佛设计学院在合作，我们希望呢，呃，给未来带来一种新的可能和机会啊、呃，去面向未来去做一些我们新的一些尝。We always say why we as architect can't do or can't copy the previous classic uh, buildings as, um, uh, as new buildings. But I think um, it's more about the potential of a collaboration and coming up with a new integration. This is what I have done with the other one, Shenzhen Airport. You can see that the airport can be like a museum. It's quite interesting. This is another project I, I took, part of, uh, took part of. This is the Shenzhen Airport. You can see how airport space can actually look like a museum. So, actually, the project is not a piece of art. It's more of a solution to solve a problem through the language of architecture. We see that we have a lot of teams working together. Uh, the Upper Hills is not just a building or a project that's coming out as a physical project, but more like an integrated solution that can be copied and、uh, pasted in other、uh, situations as well. 最后一页了。嗯，其实建筑最大的魅力就在于它没有一定之规，没有一定之法，它可以所有的东西都对，也可以所有的东西都不一定对。
所以这个才是他永恒的魅力所在。所以大家各位努力学习吧，前面的路还很长很长。The most fascinating part of architecture is it really don't really have a, a fixed way of a solution. So、uh, let's just all study hard and then try to come up with better buildings and designs. Thank you. Thanks, Zhang Jian. You tell a lot of secrets that I just learned the first time.、Right? But、uh, I will tell you a little bit more secrets because、uh, one thing that he mentioned is, which is quite important: where is architectural innovation、uh, stands, or where architectural innovation, where is the space for architectural innovation? A lot of times. Is where the developer care less or care least. You know, the the、uh, the presentation he did. They have they care most、uh, the, the apartment building, the office tower, commercial. So the least、uh, sort of there's more flexibility、uh, in that area. Maybe、uh, that's how we、uh, get started. I always start from、uh, this slides. I think what is Arbenas? Arbenas is、uh, we always think that it's more than a design practice. It's also a think tank, an urban curator and mediator. It aims to formulate architectural strategy from the complexities and uncertainties in contemporary Chinese architecture. So we are not afraid of complexity. We are not afraid of、uh, commercial projects and. So this is Shenzhen. It has been developed、uh, so quickly, and the result. Look at the left. It's New York City, right? Look at right. Where is this? Shenzhen. It's very similar, for some reason. But if you look at from Google Earth,、uh, it it presents a completely different、uh, kind of fabric. So at the point,、uh, Shenzhen and, and and the rest, of, hopefully, rest of China is rethinking、uh, the past、uh, three decades of urbanization. Is there anything that we can、uh, we can improve? And is there new sort of strategies and models that we can look for? So this is how we get this project. It's it's at a time when the city is redeveloping a lot of the previous. Uh, isolated lots, as John mentioned previously, it's in between these two hills. So we see、uh, there is a good opportunity. This is the the image we got、uh, from the planner S O M. This is the original. Okay, this is how I tell you where architecture starts, right? So this is the result of the planning. We see the the typical office towers and and hotels and shopping malls, huge shopping mall in a very isolated、uh, condition. But they decided somehow to build the bridge to connect the two parks. So we see this is a good opportunity, and then our task is to design the the 100,000 square meters of loft building, which is the linear one, on top. So we had very good discussion back and forth is whether this is the best way to really take this opportunity to not only、uh, benefit the commercial project but somehow. To benefit the city as well, so we started from there and start. Maybe we can kind of do something. The square, the the, the same square meters, but we can fold it down. Somehow create a cluster of smaller buildings, and in in a way to create like this kind of a village town、uh, condition on top of the the shopping mall. We know it's difficult. We know it's expensive, but、uh, it is worthwhile. Then we see this as an opportunity. By connecting these two parks, the people go actually back and forth, and then they go on top of the roof, and you can really be, make this a destination, and also benefits the shopping mall underneath.、Uh, looking at closer, so the fabric it becomes、uh, it, on one hand is is corresponds to all the structural system uh, underneath uh, the little town. At the same time, it has to have. Uh, a, a, a positive dialogue with the surrounding high-rise buildings, so it has to be big and small at the same time. You can't just create a cluster of village, just put it on the roof. It won't survive. 
So we decided to create this kind of a border condition. This is how we got to create a horizontal uh, kind of uh, skyscraper building to surround this little town and gradually uh, change the scale towards the center. With that uh, in mind, uh, so this becomes a more hybrid building. It, it combines a office and uh, a living quarter, a living loft, hotel and office, commercial and small office and, and living quarter. So everything kind of uh, comes together. We're adding uh, more and more complexities. Uh, so you can see all these components, they coexist. They don't compromise one another, but they together forms this uh, kind of condition where you have undulating uh, a building surrounding, kind of protecting the little village in the middle. Uh, on the same time, it, it reflects the mountains uh, nearby. And I always see this as an urban project instead of architecture project. So we thought that change and modification later on would play a role. So we designed this kind of screen wall system to allow kind of internal modifications without totally ruining the, the building. But uh, in the future, for example, if you see this double high space, they can, they can make it the living quarter or they can open a small office. And they can use this uh, corridor as a sky kind of street uh, to promote their business, whatever. So there are a lot of things that can be uh, done. This is the kind of uh, uh, just finished partially. So you can imagine uh, in the future, uh, people will customize their storefront, uh, little uh, gardens and all these and it's somehow protected by the screen wall. So it's, it's uniform, but at the same time, it's diverse. And the same thing with the, uh, the, uh, the commercial part. So we always see that this is the first step, not the final project. This is the first step. We we'll lay out the structure. We give uh, a little bit of definition of each cluster, but in the end, we hope that people will gradually uh, change, and all these changes will happen uh, according to time. So this is uh, how we uh, started uh, as this project. The other part of the presentation is really focused on the village itself and uh, the Biennale uh, in the end. Why we are so interested in the village? So it's also related to the project. We will say that uh, the 30 some years of urbanization has created a dual reality. On one hand is the kind of bottom up uh, uh, informal urbanization happening uh, in a lot of places in Shenzhen. On the other hand is the kind of top-down uh, planning. Uh, within most of these kind of new developed Chinese cities, not only in Shenzhen, but everywhere in, in, in China, the urban spaces are dominated by shopping malls, uh, uh, gated communities, uh, office towers, etc. But on the, on the other hand, there is kind of like a parallel urbanization happening, uh, the urban village. Look at this. It's kind of like a byproduct of the rapid urbanization in combination with the market economy and the urban-rural dual system inherited from Mao period. So it's kind of a hybrid condition. How many urban villages and how many people are living there? I'll give you a rough number. All these urban villages takes about one sixth, about uh, one sixth of the building area in Xinjiang, but accommodates near half of the population, which is nearly uh, 10 million. So it's very dense. Look at this map. You know, all these urban villages scattered around the city. Uh, so they provided uh, kind of a housing entity for the new immigrants uh, throughout uh, the city. This is Bai Shizhou, one of the biggest. It, it accommodates 140,000 uh, people in this single village. So it's not really a, a village. Urban village is not a right term, I think. It's, it's really an urbanized village. It's, it's, a, it's a city. And this is another one. And this is uh, Nanto. So uh, on one hand, it's super high density, uh, social complexity, uh, economic compatibility, an intertwined social network provides a vivid urban lifestyle. And also, uh, a lot of people think about these urban villages as uh, habitats for the low-income community, just the very poor people, but it's not true. 
It provides also social network uh, working opportunities for young professionals. A lot of uh, architects live in the urban villages as well. So once these villages are gone, unfortunately, right, because this is only uh, uh, affordable uh, spaces, uh, look at this map. Um, 1995, the urbanization uh, uh, actually at the edge of uh, the, the, the project that we just presented. But after uh, about 10 years, it's everywhere. So uh, that's the kind of intensity that we're looking at. So the urban villages and the great pressure um, by, from the government and also from the developers. So we're formally entering this stage of post-urban uh, village era at the moment. So in the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, you can see the kind of urban renewal projects is, is happening everywhere in Shenzhen. A lot of these huge projects, um, I mean, Mr. Zhang's project is the small one, actually. <laughs> Only one million over, right? You look at these numbers, 430. Uh, there are huge, huge uh, urban redevelopment projects happening. So the question is, is the tabula rasa model the only way when the Chinese cities are now entering the new phase of urban regeneration? Or uh, the, the kind of old uh, historical uh, areas are all swept away. It is the only way that we can achieve this kind of a standardized and globalized um, kind of a image in the end. Is this the only urbanization that we're going? It's not happening just once, it's repeated everywhere. Hundreds of these are happening. So here comes the uh, Biennale, urban coexistence, cities growing difference. So we thought that faced with this reality, we must come up with something different, a new paradigm, a new model. We believe that today's city should be a manifestation of a balanced coexistence of different value systems. It should be a civilized community with maximum heterogeneity and diversity in which people co-live in one world, sharing a variety of dreams. Remember 2008, the Beijing Olympic had one world, one dream. I thought that's pretty hair. Pretty, pretty uh, scary, right? So we should encourage people to have different dreams. It's a collection of multiple diverse dreams, right? So urban coexistence, it highlights, uh, oh, sorry. It emphasizes divergence, resistance, and hybridity. So I will tell, uh, how many time I have? 10 minutes? 40 minutes, okay, cool. So I'll tell the story about uh, this specific uh, urban village called Nanto, which is the main venue of uh, this Biennale. It's gonna end two weeks from now, unfortunately, but I will start with it. A lot of people are saying that Shenzhen uh, is a kind of miracle city. You start from a little fishing village. Is this true or false? Let's do a test, true or false. Shenzhen is starts from a little fishing village. Shenzhen only have a history of 30 some years. Is that true or not? True. Let me say, okay, from today on, don't say that anymore, right? It's false. Shenzhen have never been a fishing village, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you. Shenzhen has much longer history than 30 years, okay? I'll tell you why. It starts from a city. It's never been, it has ever been a city, starting from 1,700 years ago. It's a city, and it's a powerful big city. Dongjin, Jin Dynasty, it starts uh, as a city. Throughout the history, from Jin to Tang, and Ming, and Qing, and it has always been a city. And it's the city that actually controls a vast area, including today's Hong Kong and Macau. Right? Look at this map. It's, this is where the city is, uh, Nanto. That's a county town. It's, it's a very powerful it's a, a, a historical town in Ming Dynasty. 
In, this is uh, the, the map uh, which separates Hong Kong. Hong Kong was officially ceded to the British after the Opium War uh, from this particular county called Nantou. Amazing history, right? So, and, and the city has been a city through the Republican period, before the communists took over. It has always been a city. Look at this, this is a county. It's always there. In 1953, the communists, uh, after the communists took power, they moved the county office to Luohu, which is today is Shenzhen, because of the Canton uh, Hong Kong Railroad. It's closer. So start from 1953, Nantou became a little village. So the city first, village, and then becomes a village, right? Look at this. And it continues. Then, we all know, after uh, 1980s, when Deng Xiaoping opened the power, it opened the, 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 uh, the country, it becomes uh, concurrent with the, the urbanization becomes an urban village. So this is how Nanto looked like today. So it's a village and a city. Right? It has factories. Uh, it has super dense housing. Uh, but it's vibrant. It's livable. And it's cheaper to live. Now I would say that it's another kind of typology. It's the called village city coexistence. So it's actually a, a combination of a village and a historical town. It's the overlap, one on top of the other. Look at this map. This is a research we did from documentation in history and also uh, from the current condition. So you see that in the 50s, uh, the city wall was gradually developed, uh, demolished. Now only the south gate and east gate still remaining. The rest of that, you still see historical buildings here and there buried, but the fabric still exists for all these years. Even all the buildings have been kind of redone, but, but closer look, you will see buildings built. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a complete kind of full uh, uh, a kind of presentation of buildings built in all these areas, which is very rare in Shenzhen. In Shenzhen, most of the time, you see buildings built after the 1980s. But here, you'll see buildings from Qing Dynasty onwards. So it has a great variety of buildings, including this one. This is the oldest building in Ming Dynasty, which is actually much older than Tiananmen, trust me. Right? So, uh, Enter the city, so you see a very authentic uh, ancestor halls. Surprise, Shenzhen is old, very old. Right? And you see clubhouses. You see here and there, still buried in between these buildings. Amazing uh, condition. You see also buildings, great architecture, built in the 50s. Right? Together, they form this whole picture. It's a whole a full spectrum of of, of buildings built and the different lifestyle coexist in the city. So we did this uh, master plan. For the city has been trying to do something for Nanchou. He's trying to boost uh, uh, the, the tourism. He tried to do a lot of things, but never happened just because of the complexity in the village. So we come up with this plan. Okay, gradually we do bit side by bits. Look at the right. Uh, this is the Biennale site. So the Biennale really becomes a, a instrument, a kind of first step to initiate uh, the gradual uh, opening and, and modification of the historical town. So we actually put the Biennale everywhere uh, in the historical town, not just for the Biennale, but also for the future. So it opened up public spaces and, and connecting the park uh, behind and the Shenan Avenue, right in, cr in front of the, uh, 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 the compound. So this main line of, of, of happenings, this is where uh, the regeneration starts. And also, the kind of Biennale follows this path. And this is the kind of vision that we, uh, we give. So we create a lot of works. We invited artists and architects from all over the world 
to create works along that line to generate public spaces start right at the very beginning uh, of uh, the site. And then this is Zhang Yunho, they did this uh, pavilion, uh, uh, which will be permanent building for the uh, village. And there are exhibitions everywhere uh, in, the, in the town. There are paintings from Italian uh, artists. There are little random, uh, kind of uh, modifications and uh, regeneration projects going on here and there. For example, we found this uh, interesting kind of condition where it's this little square in the middle with uh, two additional sort of metal shed that create this kind of interesting kind of public plaza area, but it's blocked. Uh, by these two buildings. So in a way that we figure out, instead of doing big demolitions, we only demolish these two temporary structure in the whole process. Uh, and then rebuild something for the villagers to, as a trade off uh, for further uh, uh, development. So this is the picture in the 90s that is always been the market kind of square in the middle. And it's filled up with uh, temporary kind of uh, buildings on both ends. And, but it's very alive uh, at, not, at night. So we decided to expand the very limited public space towards the roof of the building. So we see this, this is not really an architecture. It's really about our urban design, how to re-kind of uh, define the public space and how to improve that uh, little square and make it more accessible. And then try to connect with the other buildings and things like that. So architecture can do a lot. So this is the vision that we have to impress the government uh, to show them if we do that, okay, uh, how much we can achieve uh, by doing that. So in the end, you see that little building. So this is a very important step to benefit the village in order to do other uh, things. So we give them this space uh, uh, follow the original footprint of that original building to look to make it visually legal, right? because everything in the urban village is not theoretically legal. So we have to. There's no rules, that, no procedures that you can go through. So we have to follow this and change it to uh, to little buildings and, and make it uh, public accessible. So I just. So people can actually go onto the roof and overlook the streets and see the other exhibitions. This is a pop-up store. During the Biennale, there are gonna be uh, other functions after. So the, the plaza becomes a, a kind of interesting attraction at the moment. And the second floor of this building becomes a kind of a town hall uh, condition where a lot of these symposiums and discussions will happen. So this is the factory zone. This is very typical also in all of the urban villages. In, in the 80s and 90s, villagers built factories and rent it out to make uh, money. So these factories were all kind of uh, very typical, but we decided to keep it and to open it up, um, to connect it with the rest of uh, uh, the urban village. So we invited artists and architects to do interventions and try to, inf uh, to change uh, the kind of, uh, this kind of space and make it more public. We demolish part of the wall and make it open to the entire village. So the village really uh, can merge uh, with the, the kind of once isolated factory buildings. And it becomes like a market uh, plaza. So you can see we invited people, uh, Nara uh, Tarani from uh, Cooper Union, he designed this uh, structure. And MVVADV did design the other uh, installation, so at night. So uh, a lot of things have changed. This is uh, Atelier Bawa. He designed uh, this kind of a da pai da for <laughs> eating, and with some local architects also uh, involved. So it becomes really a kind of a nice place for the young people to gather and to have a drink and sit. So quickly, I'll show you the exhibition. Um, so. The thematic exhibition is on the ground floor. It's more open. It, it's really not just the exhibition. It suggests that there's the intention that we want to open up the uh, factory uh, to make it little streets and plazas. So it, it, using Biennale as an opportunity to open up uh, the entire ground floor 
to make an internal streets and, and, and so it suggests something uh, of an urban strategy. So all the exhibition sessions happens inside the boxes and also on the streets. It's very interactive. Um, you see some of these uh, exhibitions. Uh, and also we have uh, urban, this ar uh, urban archive uh, about urban villages. We also have very detailed research and uh, even the, the, the staircase is used. And there are also Columbia University is doing all this uh, data mining uh, research about urban village and also graphic uh, presentations of how urban village is demolished. So it's a very kind of rich uh, texture uh, in the exhibition. Um, so you'll see that uh, by doing all these uh, kind of uh, efforts, the exhibitions start to merge uh, into the urban uh, fabric. These are some of the old buildings that uh, is being used and fixed. Um, so the very last one is this, uh, this, this stage, this public stage building. A lot of people don't know this. It's just a typical shed, right? But in the 1980s and the 90s, this is very popular in every single urban village where factory workers entertain themselves. They use this very shabby building to do karaoke, to, to express themselves, to have a little bit of fun after uh, hard work. So this is something is very popular, was very popular, but after the city uh, surrounding these villages and all the factories moved out of the city, all these buildings were demolished. So we were surprised to find one here. So we decided to leave it, we found, in, in the very hot weather. Uh, people are, uh, old, especially old people, sitting there and playing chess and playing mahjong. It's a good place. But we were asked by the client to enclose it, to do a, a, a black box theater. So we were kind of hesitant. You know, is there a way that we can do something? And after the Biennale, we give it back. So we, we decided to make it a very uh, sort of temporary building with a curtain, kind of lift up, and put it down. So it's flexible. It can accommodate all the symposiums and discussions and lectures during the Biennale. But after, it can be given back um, to the village. So this is how it looked like, um, the building. And uh, we only input some tiered uh, spaces inside. But uh, it, it works well. Uh, only unfortunate is that uh, during the opening, it was extremely cold in the tents. So people, even from New York and Boston, feel like they have never experienced that cold in Shenzhen. They never expect it. So I have to explain each time before the opening, I said, I have to explain. I have to say sorry, but I have to explain why this is a big kind of gift back to the village. So bear with us. So, uh, so they were uh, very happy in the end. So we have a series of discussions with the villagers and discuss the future. There's going to be one more big uh, event uh, a week from now. But in the end, I think this is also related to Mr. Zhang. Right? We are very glad the, the, the Biennale is not just a final result. It's really a beginning for kind of spontaneous, self-sponsored, uh, little modifications and renovations. Everything is happening uh, gradually. So. I think, uh, in conclusion, the Biennale is not just an event. It's, it is not just an exhibition. It's an intervention. And it is an action. This is where architects can play the role. Thank you. Um. I want to ask a question on behalf of a real estate student who just left to Mr. Zhang Jian. And I will first uh, say it in English and then repeat it in Chinese. And uh, her question is, can you explain more about why you prefer not to include hotels in your complex? Is that because the cost of hotels are higher than other types of de development? Or is that because you just don't want to deal with the hotel management? Okay. You pretend not to speak. Actually, this question has no relationship with the 
？这个是其实国内和国外的会计准则不一样。比方说，我们国内我们建一个酒店，它不计算它我们会计学上叫公允价值。你比方说到香港，它就可以计算它公允价值，但是在国内呢，它不计算，就是。所以我们持有这样的物业的时候，你看到它的财务报表上永远是折旧财务费用，啊，那么其实它能够现金流能够回正就已经很困难了，啊，那么再加上不断的五年到八年的时间，我还要重新再去投入，重新再去装修，因为客人永永远希望那个酒店是新新的，所以在这种状态下呢，呃，至少是在中国大陆的这个范围内是，其实这个倒不是说这个是放在。全球都一样的，就在中国大陆这个范围内，这个呃呃酒店呃这种物业资产太重了，这个而且呢，呃投资回报也不是很好，而且隔几年还要重新装修，呃、这个和呃他的管理者是谁并没有太大的关系啊。Okay, yeah. So you all heard the question, right? So this is a quite Different situation only happened in mainland China. That it, it's it, even in Hong Kong, it's a different story. So in mainland China, um, there's like different uh policy uh, about this hotel, and also uh, it's hard to keep the cash flow uh for the hotel uh um investment, and also uh you keep you need to keep changing and updating and uh like renovate a hotel so that all the client uh, all the people who come to live they think it's a new hotel still. So uh it's not a really um good um investment for um, Um, developers. It's not an architecture issue. Um, thank you. Um, so during the winter, we have the fortune to visit the Biennale. Um, uh, we saw it was very, very impressive. Um, so my question dealt with a conversation that we had with a uh, planning agent in Shenzhen who said uh, probably somewhere down the line in the future, um, these uh, urban village are going to be redeveloped. Um, to um, maximize the density, um, a lot of high-rise apartments, um, um, like uh, the project we're just talking about. And I, I'm, my question is: Is there um, some level of urban fabric, or um, the good characters of these urban villages could be potentially protected and preserved in the new development? Uh, thank you. Uh It's a very good question. I think it is always a danger. There is always a motivation uh, to demolish and rebuild because of uh, it's simply a money issue. It's really a kind of uh, the pressure from uh, the city to develop the inner core, and also uh, the developers are looking. There are huge players you have already seen uh, to. Uh, look at this as a great opportunity to to uh, to make more money, and uh, so this is why the Biennale. Uh, we think that is the right on time. It's a very urgent situation, so we really see Nanto as uh, a one of the rare opportunity that we can maybe do a different model, just because of the historical town status. Was there even? A lot of the buildings are not historical, but there was the title there. It doesn't guarantee the hundred percent safety, but by providing a different model to show people, to show the city, and show especially the local people, they can make benefits by keeping it and make it better, and also provide a, a good housing, a good public facility. Uh, is another way because there is really a big lack of, of examples, living examples, for people to see uh, whether there it might be a successful uh, second thought. Because if you look at Shenzhen's recent uh, development, is, there seems to be only one way to deal with all this urban village, which is demolition. And we do. Everybody know that. Everybody want to get rich. Even people who live in Nantou for many many years, right? I mean, the the landowners, not the renters, the landowners wants to do that. But they are hesitant because of this title. So we see this as a good opportunity 
to put these public events in and, and, and deliver a different uh, opportunity. So this is why I say this is not an exhibition. It's really a battle. It's really a battle uh, of, about time. Who come up with uh, the second kind of opportunity first? Because we, before that, uh, nobody thought about it can survive. Nobody wants it to be survived. But now, it might change. So we got some, uh, let, let me tell you this, we got some positive response already, uh, saying that because the government has invested a lot of money for the Biennale, they, they want to structurally make the buildings uh, more sound, you know, they invest a lot of money. They want to keep it. So this is a good sign. Um, but we'll see. It's a very good question. I want to这里不一定是有矛盾的你可能会有一个很好的解决方案这里不一定是一定是一定是冲突的也许会有一种方式去很好的把这些冲突把它解决掉这个其实永远在发展和保护里面这种矛盾就好像我刚才说的其实是有第
each village should have a very different strategy, kind of custom-made uh, for that particular village. I think that's the kind of uh, thing we want to promote. Is this on? Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I guess this is a follow-up question for the previous two questions. And um, like you presented in, the pre um, in your presentation, the Shenzhen, um, I'm from Beijing, and like growing up, what you learn in history book, it's always like this little fisherman village. You know, like it's very new, and, it's, and it seems like this is the kind of image that the, the government wants to promote. You know, we're not, you know, leveraging our historical asset, which most people didn't even know, uh, but we want to present ourselves as this new, you know, city popped out of nowhere in the past 30 years. Um, so I, I think I, I totally agree about like, you know, providing alternatives. Um, and I think my question is like politically, I guess, is the city um, trying to do any like in terms of policy or incentivizing developer um, kind of leveraging on this kind of historical village conditions um, to kind of I don't know, like um, integrate this his historical heritage as part of the city's identity. And I guess for the developers, from the developer's side, um, I agree this kind of like, you know, integrating preservation is kind of like a long-term investment. But, you know, as in Beijing, you already see like preservation is now like, you know, part of the planning. And it's, I mean, it's gone through a really long process. Um, and I guess from a developer's perspective is, is there anything that the government could do in terms of incenti like incentives and policy to better push people to go into these villages um, and kind of you know take advantage of what's already there instead of um, taking out of everything? Sorry, that's a really long question. Actually, I think the city is more and more, uh, I would say, aware of this. You know, 30, 40 years, just like a man, you know, after 30, 40 years old, you start to have this kind of feeling you want to, to deal a little bit about memory of where it come from. It's, it's quite natural. Uh, before, it was nobody cared. You know, the city always wanted to promote itself as, as a white sheet of paper starting from scratch. Because... Otherwise, you know, if they promote uh, the history and all this, it can't compete with Xi'an, with Beijing, and all these kind of older cities. It's, it's such strategy, I think, is intentional. But after all these years of, of crazy development, now it is time to rethink. And they think about, they have a lot of problems because of the people who don't feel belonging to the city. They, they want to make money and they want to go somewhere else. The city is really lack something that glue everybody together. It just really lack something for sure. So I think this is a, a kind of a time. We can sense it because I witnessed the whole process almost. I think the last four or five years, it's, I can see the, the change, the shift already. Um, but it's difficult because of the, I mean like compared to Beijing, Beijing, the biggest power is politics. It's political power is a key player. But Shenzhen is the capital, is the money. It's like the two extreme conditions. They are all the big brother, right? So it's, it's very hard to compete with these guys. Um, how to do that? And I think the government definitely has a key role to balance that for the developer. If you want to develop, if there is an old historical village there, if you keep it for some reason, I can yield more FAR, whatever. Right. So there, there's, there is something that the government should do, and they are doing it at the moment. But they are still in the process. They're very slow. But they're, they're in, in the learning curve, I think. Okay.
政府这方面就是有没有类似像政策呀，或者是这种 incentives， 就是这种，就是就是来鼓励开发商来做类似的事情，或者是鼓励开发商做一些。其实我刚才我听明大概听明白你的意思了哈，呃，其实这里关键是什么呢？其实就是这个我们来看哈。就是你的盈利模式和你的盈利模型到底是什么？其实，呃，啊，我们刚才说的那种用建筑去达成一种平衡，但是背后支撑它的一定还是我的盈利模式和盈利模型。那么，呃，在刚才这种问题上，其实呢，呃，我觉得还是需要，其实更多的是需要，呃，某种程度上就好，好像我刚才说的，三方的这种很好的在一起建立一种很好的沟通和。这个更难的是什么？是互相的一种信任，这个是最难的。现在某种程度上是，呃，其实建筑师在这里是弱势的，其实是政府和发展商之间是互相不信任的。在这种不不信任之下，不不信任之下呢，造成的沟通的难度非常大，也就是建立一种你心目当中的那种理想的那种模型的难度，其实是挺大的，其实是挺大的。你说那个有没有成不成？有没有机会？一定有，一定可以。但是关键是现在就是好像一边在砌墙，一边在翻墙，这个越来难度越大。这个不在不在那个不,不在有没有，而在于现在这种环境。其实我觉得，其实某种上我我对这个蛮悲观的。我觉得可能性不是太大，这不是技术上的问题。呃，关键。Oh, okay. So I'll conclude that first. So I keep talking about the relationship between the three sides, the architect, the uh, developer, and the government. Actually, the most important thing behind it is actually the the profit, the profit mode, the profit model that's generating. Uh, the, this whole kind of collaboration. And actually, architects are not playing a very important role in this kind of collaboration, but more as the uh, relation between the developer and the government. And uh, what uh, there's always, in, in right now, the context of like uh, Chinese or like some other places in the world, there's always the, uh, there's lack of the trust in between the developer and government. That's making the most issue when you're like doing this kind of development. Like they don't really trust each other and then it's hard to uh, believe what developers are actually doing and it's hard to imagine. Although he's like trying very hard with uh, try to come up with more trust and a uh, better project as a president. Uh, 在政府的大多数政府的心目中，那个并不是他的理想，啊，所以其实，就好像我刚才说的，某种程度上，这个也需要建筑师更加努力，这个是一个很好的开始。他们突然看到还有一种方式，但是以前他们脑子里还没有这种方式存在。我觉得未来说不定，但是目前这种不信任，恰恰是很很难去一步一步的去去怎么样去放松的啊啊，这个是个很好的开始，绝对是个。As it's hard to deal with uh, in, uh, the, the lack of trust uh, between the two, I think it's more important for us as designers and architects to come up with um, better designs and better solutions so, so that you, they can have, pay more attention to what we're doing and uh, probably a third way of uh, solution. Uh, thank, you. thank you for your presentation. And my, my question is, um, so uh, how to keep the model of um, this kind of regeneration, I mean, in Nanto, um, be sustainable in the future. Uh, because I think uh, the Urban Village Collective or the Urban Village Company is also the uh, most important role uh, in the Urban Village regeneration. Uh, so in Nanto, what's the next plan? Uh, or what's the next uh, vision uh, uh, after the exhibition uh, of government and the developer? Yeah, uh, because I had the field study in Nantou for uh, last year, and I had focused on this area for, for a long time. So I want to know what's the next uh, plan this. Uh, I, I can't predict the future, um, but I can tell you the immediate uh, sort of uh, happening. Uh, a week from now, there's going to be a major uh, symposium that we organize as uh, the Biennale events. Before the closing ceremony, there are going to be uh, government uh, people from the Urban Planning Bureau, and from the district government, and also the Nanto 
uh, share a company head. You know, all these different people will get together. This is how we manage. Uh, we don't know the future, but let's talk about it. Let's negotiate. Let's see what other people. They're going to be representative also from the, the, the residents. So we're going to have this kind of a, a, kind of like an American town hall meeting, but we create this space always, right? And then people talk about their own needs and, and, and concerns. So we'll find out um, what's going to happen because a lot of people think that Nanto at the moment might have a third way instead of keep it, demolish it, there might be something in the middle. So Nanto could be one. So that's why everybody was willing to, to share, even from the, 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 uh, the stock company uh, of Nanto, the, 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 the village company. Uh, they want to know what can we do after the Biennale. So uh, this is, uh, I would say, is a good sign at the moment. I think that as said by uh, Mr. Zhang, Nobody knows. I mean, the developer, um, there are developers are thinking about uh, doing something. So the, I think at the point where the developer, the government, they always want to do something, but they were not sure. If they are sure they want to do something, they get it done immediately. There's no place for architects and, and, and people like us, right? This is the, 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 the strategy. At the time when they are not sure, they are all the biggest player, powerful players, but they are not sure. At the moment, architects and planners can play a role. You provide a third, a different, either yours, neither yours, but we create something in the middle. Maybe by innovation, by creating new typology, then use architecture as a language to bring everybody together. This is how we see this uh, as an opportunity. 如果我来看目前来看刚才他说的政府的一些规章和一些制度呀 yeah, it's a very successful model although it's a temporary exhibition but uh, i think uh, the one thing dangerous behind it is most of the developers or investment uh, investors they see the um value that's behind but i, I think we should more focus on uh, two points first of all is the um the mode, uh, the communication mode that's between uh, the all the villagers together with all the different layers of government. And the second one is to probably come up with a policy that can deal with this, um, uh, this kind of uh, coexistence. Chi 进行一些转移的基础上才存在盈利模式
嗯，这个可能我觉得，呃，就是就是就这个，呃，的确就怎么说呢？这个我们真的要坐下来谈很多问题，才能把这个事情谈清楚。因为这个基于，首先就刚才我说的，有这种协同机制；第二个有一些新的规则，在新规则之下，建筑师要有一种新的，就是这个边界到底在哪里，要清晰。在这种新的边界之下，呃、其实我们就可以去尝试在里边。做做出来，因为我要投资，我一定要赚钱的嘛，对吧？我我才能才会在这里面尝试去怎么样做，才能就好像其实刚才那个项目，我们也是在保持平衡，就是怎么样把这个平衡还能保持得好。只有保持得好平衡的，你们都很清楚，这个模式才能往下走。要不然的话，这个东西就变成了可能很快就没有了啊。所以核心就是在于要确认它的。就刚才说的，就要来来我看，确认他的产权，不能完全的转让他的产权，在一定范围内可以转让他的产权，这是最关键的。但是这个我恐怕也是政府，可能也是最头疼的啊。就好像刚才他说的，能不能一个村子就有一个政策，一个一个一个股份公司结合一个地方就有它的一个独特的一种规则，只适用于这个边界内，这个也是很重要的，对吧？嗯，其实核心在于。有限范范围范围内的一些产权的一些转移，啊，如果能这个能做到，它的盈利模式就存在；要不然的话，呃，不存在。最关键是这个。Okay, the question is basically about the business model of Nanto Village or village like this, this kind. Uh, so uh, right now they don't have, uh, they don't really have a business mode and no profit the same uh, right now. But in the future, maybe there could be like a, a pretty good business model of like transferring some of the property ownership and uh, also, uh, but only within a, a certain uh, extent, not, not, not to like all the properties. I think we're somehow out of time, and uh, thank you all for coming today. And if you have more questions, you can probably ask later. Thank you.